without further ado, uh, Tristan is going to talk a little bit more about storytelling and some of the interesting stuff that the BBC has been doing. Hello. Uh, is this microphone working? I think it is. Um, yeah, I'm Tristan um, from the BBC's Research and Development Department in London. Um, so the BBC does stories. Um, it does them for TV, it does them for radio, it does them for the web. Um, it does it for news, drama, learning, um, children's. Um, and my R&D team kind of works at that intersection of stories and media and the web. Um, I was once an engineer and a software developer quite a long time ago. Um, I'm now a digital producer and product manager, I guess. Um, and in recent work, I've specialized in various forms of stories on the web. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so stories have form and structure. They have beginnings, they have middles, they have endings. Um, they have people, places, and things, um, setbacks, climaxes, and conflicts. And most stories have those. Um, the web has form and structure as well. It has sites, and it has pages and links, it has interactivity and personalization and adaptation. So I'm going to have a little look in this talk about how stories and the web can interconnect and maybe overlap in some of those aspects. Um, looking at some examples of like my favorite things that I found and also some examples of work that we've done at the BBC. These are anything from choosing your level of detail for something, varying the length or personalizing it, to interacting with expl explanations, to um, some of our latest experiments that we've been doing with voice-controlled stories. And then I'll talk a bit about how the BBC has been experimenting with deconstructing and atomizing media and stories into its fundamental building blocks that we can then present in new and powerful ways. So when I say stories, um, I mean it in kind of the broad sense, so anything from news to history to myth to fiction to literature. Um, and stories are found in lots of forms of human creativity, from art to music to film to literature to video games. And stories can be for information, they can be for education, and they can be for entertainment, which incidentally is the BBC's mission statement. Um, I don't know if that was its actual mission statement in 1922, but that's when the BBC was formed. And nearly a thousand years ago, Iceland has invented a new form of storytelling. So your sagas, um, so you've got form here. So I'm going to start by looking a bit at the web as a form of media and some of its structures and forms. Um, so these are some characteristics which I think the web has um, and are particularly relevant. Um, these might be a bit obvious, but bear with me. So the web's universal. universal. It's available to everybody, like whenever and wherever. Uh, anybody can create and publish things on the web. And you can publish in whatever form you like and you can mix your media and do all sorts of things. The web runs on computers, so it's programmable. That lets you create and change media and decide how it's presented. You can give the user control over things. You can make things interactive. You can adapt it to what people want. The web's not just one thing after another. It's, it's kind of non-linear in nature. So on the web, things are broken up, reordered, expanded, compressed, defined. And obviously, it's interconnected. The web is made of links between things. And as I said in the intro, the web's got its own form and structure. Everything on it is made of markup and characters and paragraphs and images and pages and sites and links, all of which is readable by humans and computers. And stories can be said to have some similar characteristics. They're universal. The best stories can speak to many diverse groups of people. Stories can change depending on who's telling it. The storyteller might adapt it to their perspective or their values or might adapt it to their audience. And stories also change over time as they're retold. Stories can be said to be interconnected. So in fiction, you've always got connections to other stories, you've got references, you've got spin-offs, you've got adaptations. And in the real world, everything's interconnected anyway. And stories are structured. So this is a bit of a detour, just because I'm like, really interested by this stuff. It's slightly off track. But um, this is a detour into the structures of stories. So this is a thing called the inverted pyramid, which comes from the news industry. It's like newspaper articles have this long-standing structure. The lead at the top of the article or the story gives the most newsworthy information. So who, when, where, what, why, and how. 
the next bit, the body, gives more details about what's happened, and the tail gives kind of context and background information. And this came from, originally came from printed newspapers. So the um, editors sometimes needed to cut the length of the story to fit it onto the page and therefore into the newspaper. And having this structure meant you could just cut bits off the bottom and the story would still make sense, if, even if it didn't have quite the same context. And it also means, as a, as a kind of byproduct of that, that the, the reader gets the most vital information first, assuming they've been following the story. So newspapers have structure. And over the history of storytelling, um, there's been many new forms and structures and conventions. So poetry has iambic pentameter and sonnets. Literature has novels and short stories. Plays all have acts and scenes. Writers might use first person or third person narrators. And there's common storytelling tropes that you find in kind of all TV and, and movies. So many structures exist. And you can say that stories have shapes as well. So this is, this is the classic five-act structure graft. Um, so the exposition at the beginning, rising action to the climax of the story, falling action, and then the resolution at the end. And you'll find that lots of um, literature and movies kind of follow that classic structure and variations of that. There's three acts, five acts, seven acts. There's loads and loads of books written about how to write stories. And I've been collecting drawings and diagrams of stories for a while, because it interests me. Um, this is, you might have seen XKCD's movie charts. Um, so it shows the groups of characters and their journeys um, in movies. So Lord of the Rings, those are the, the Fellowship and Frodo and whatnot and Star Wars, um, and there's even, I don't know if anyone's seen Primer, this like time terrible movie, so that's funny if you've seen it. Um, there's even a GitLab project to um, make your own visualizations like that now. And this is Kurt Vonnegut's graph of the story of Cinderella. So the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is happiness. So she starts off at the bottom left in a pretty bad situation, then her fairy godmother I don't know, do, do you have the story of Cinderella in Iceland? This might make no sense at all. Anyway, um, she starts off in a bad situation. Um, her fairy godmother gives her a sequence of gifts. Those are the rising steps until she goes to the ball and meets the prince. Well, that's the highlight. But then it's midnight, disaster strikes, she loses everything, and she's plunged back into misery. Finally, the prince discovers her. Uh, the slipper fit, fits, and uh, they live happily ever after, and the graph goes off to infinity. Sorry, that's the end of my detour into visualizing stories. Back to the web. So what do we get if we put some of those characteristics of the web together with stories? And where might we find interesting intersections that make new things? So these are some things I like and some things that we've built at the BBC. So using the web, we can give users some control over how they might experience a story. That could just be clicking links and falling down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. Or it could be like this guide to blockchain technology, which lets you decide how to explain something. I love it. It's so simple as well. Um, control could be a choose your own adventure. Um, so this is a choose your own adventure telling of a blackbird's life in a city which is just really cute. It's like your only choice is to hop. Or preen. Or it could even be something um, like an interactive voice-controlled story, um, which this is something my team's building. I'm not sure if the videos, the audio is going to work, but let's see. Uh, no. Answer some questions like this. Oh, Perhaps stop what you're doing, sit down, and come close. As part of the inspection, you will have to answer some questions like this Dream or reality? Which one? Dream. Reality. Very well. Reality it is. 
Now, if you ever feel a bit lost, just ask for help. I'm afraid I can't always promise to help you. But it always feels good to say it out loud, doesn't it? Help! Ha 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 ha. Seriously, if you find yourself feeling lost or wondering where in the universe you are, that is perfectly normal. The problem with voice interfaces is they make terrible product videos. <laughs> Uh, so that was um, making things uh, controllable. What if we want to make stories more personal, so things that can adapt to you and your needs um, in a certain moment? We don't even have to ask anything, because your browser probably knows quite a lot about you already, where you are, what device you're using, what sites you visited. At its simplest, this could be something like a responsive web design that, that chooses the best layout for your screen size. Or my friend Frankie made, made this responsive text prototype, where the the layout and the words change when you change the screen size. And as Brian was explaining before, my BBC colleague Ian Forrester uses the term perceptive media to describe stories that adapt to something about you to make that story hopefully more compelling or engaging. And his first example was a radio drama which featured a talking lift. Um, that was quite convenient because it meant he could use a machine-generated voice which he could program. Um, and that would drop in facts about where you were right now to make that story feel a little bit closer to kind of to you, to make more of a connection, I guess. Um, and for TV, he's been developing a short film that changes to suit your preferences and personality. Um, so it has a personalized soundtrack um, based on things that you like or don't like. Um, it even uses kind of this adaptive color grading of the film to kind of match your mood and your personality. And it does all that in the browser. And lastly, on this kind of personal front, another R&D project called Cake, which is a TV cooking show which adapts itself to your skills and how much time you've got. Um, I'll let my colleagues describe it. My name is Bella. Welcome to my kitchen. The Cook Along Kitchen Experience, or CAKE as we call it, is a new object-based prototype that lets you learn new recipes and skills by cooking along to a program that works at your pace. It's a browser app that responds in real time to what's happening in your kitchen. It presents video clips and instructional content in the ways that are most appropriate for you, the device you're using and your environment. This experience happens in real time, so it's not a passive watch. It's an experience that opens up an ongoing collaborative dialogue between the program and the audience. This is where we land with the cake app and the first thing we need to do is choose the recipes we're going to cook. Next we're asked how many people we're cooking for, that's so that we can scale the ingredients in the recipe. After that you ask for a bit of context about your kitchen. Next you get a summary of all the ingredients I need to shop for or find in the cupboard. That's how long it's going to take. Let's start cooking. Right, let's preheat the oven ready for our fish dish. So what about programmable? How could we use more explicitly programmatical things on the web to help tell stories? Well, one thing I really like, uh, something that Brett Victor originally described called explorable explanations. And he said, what if a book didn't just give you old facts, but gave you the tools to discover those ideas for yourself and invent new ideas? And he meant things like this. So this is his simple example. It's an article about entrance fees for national parks. But actually in the text, you can change some of the proposed values, and then you can see what the results are like in the article as you change it in real time, which is really cute. Um, and this is a more complex one from a developer and designer called Nikki Case, who makes lots of lovely interactive guides and so this is rather than trying to explain predator-prey relationships in words, um, this is a tool that lets you explore feedback loops. Um, so more foxes mean fewer rabbits, which mean fewer foxes, which means more rabbits. Um, and you can try and explain that, but it's a lot better if you make a thing like that and you can press the buttons to see what happens. Um, the latest thing from Nikki is great, um, but it's way too long to show, but it's kind of a tool game presentation that explains trust and game theory. Um, it's at that URL, I think. And on the web, things can be broken up, reordered, expanded, compressed, and defined, and linked together. So what does that mean for stories? Um, 
This is just a quote that I found. Um, so this is from 1995 from Nicholas Negroponte, who was like head of MIT Media Lab at the time, I think. And he said, think of hypermedia as a collection of elastic messages that can stretch and shrink in accordance with the reader's actions. Ideas can be opened and analyzed at multiple levels of detail. Sounds really powerful. And if you think back to that news pyramid, what if you don't need that contextual background information at the bottom of the pyramid um, because you've been following the story? Or what if you want bits of your news story to come from different sources? So theoretically on the web, we can let people choose which bits they want to see or where they want to see them from. So Circa was a news app from a few years ago. Um, it's now defunct. Um, but it was, it was built out of kind of chunks or atoms of news and then used them to present stories as updates and facts and quotes. And then it would track a reader's progress and it would avoid showing them bits of the stories that they'd already seen, unlike a normal news article where you're forever reading things that you already know if you've been following that story. Um, I thought it was really clever. And Vox does a similar thing. Um, it has kind of reusable fact cards that it can kind of link into its stories. And at the BBC, we've been kind of experimenting this kind of thing as well. So you can skim through the spine of the story. That might be all you want. Or you can dig into the detail if you need it or are interested. Um, and even provides pop-up definitions of possibly unfamiliar terms or events. Uh, this was like, designed for um, younger audiences of news who kind of show these behaviours of skimming through stuff and then occasionally if something's really interesting they will read it in depth. Um, but sometimes they find it difficult to follow the news stories in the way that the BBC writes them because we assume quite a lot of knowledge for kind of, of history and, and kind of current affairs and it's not particularly accessible. So this was our experiment to kind of um, have a go at meeting that need. And this is a browser plugin from Bloomberg, which sits on top of the web and then presents business data about the companies that were mentioned in the story that you're currently reading. So they're actually linking out. Very few people link out to stuff in kind of the news area. So these were, these were some different ways that um, people are telling stories using the materials of the web. Um, these were just some of my favourites. Um, hopefully one of those might inspire you. And we've seen how you can use the web to make stories that are programmable and controllable and personal and non-linear. And it actually says structured as well, which I haven't talked about. Because one of the things that all the forms and experiences that I've shown have in common is that they're not just one big lump of story. It's not just one thing. They're usually made up of smaller bits with actions or links or branches that join them together. And this is a really important principle that we've been using at BBC R&D. We've been atomizing and structuring our stories. You might know, you might have heard of um, web design and software development practices that aim to create self-contained components. So there's atomized design and there's object-oriented programming. And the idea is that these use concepts of objects or atoms that can be reused in different places. And this helps with efficiency. It means you don't have to keep rewriting things and you can reuse things around. It keeps things consistent. It makes it simpler to build things. So can we do that with stories? And if you look at the structures and the shapes of the stories that I talked about earlier, and you're an information architect or an engineer, and you love the web, then you may, might be tempted to try to model the data structure of stories. And it might look something like that. Um, bonus points if anyone knows what episode that is. I, I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, not exactly like that. More like that. So this is some work we've done um, on modeling news stories and fiction. And this data model, don't worry if you don't read data models as rendered by designers. Um, this is the model shown here for fiction. Um, so stories are made up of things that happen, um, which are the events. Um, and these are portrayed, for instance, as scenes in TV drama. Um, stories might have multiple storylines, which might interconnect and interlock. Um, and those events in those storylines feature people, normally, almost always, almost always happen in a place. Um, and the people in the stories usually have relationships with other people or groups of people. So you can kind of model the, 
the structure of those stories. And it's obviously more complicated than this, but this broadly models fictional and factual stories that we've thrown at it so far. So what? So we call this atomized media or object-based media. And by deconstructing our stories into these fundamental structured building blocks or atoms, and then fitting those atoms to a data model, then we can kind of create reusable bits of stories that we then know when and how to use, and we can put them together again in different ways. So there might be an atom for each event or each character in a story, and that atom might be represented in different ways. So there might be a video clip of that story, or there might be a text, a piece of text for it. If we label each of those atoms with data, then that means computers know what to do with it. And it gives us the ability to adapt our stories to different screens, platforms, contexts, and experiences. So we can put extra bits in, we can pull bits out, we can render it in different ways. And hopefully that will make the stories suitable for phones, tablets, watches, TVs, voice interfaces, artificial intelligences, whatever comes next. And we can put those atoms back together in different ways as well to make some of these kind of experiences that I've looked at. And because there are always more and more new things and new devices and platforms and places on the web to get stories, from Google AMP to Instant Stories, from Line to Vine, from chatbots to Snapchat. And rather than create more and more stuff each time for each of these new platforms, then if we atomize our stories into these reusable chunks, then we can efficiently use them again and again on whatever comes next without having to rewrite everything. And that's what I think makes atomized media powerful for us. So that was the one principle. Uh, so just, just some lessons I've learned in my work on stories in the web. So the tools of your craft or your trade and the tools of the web will go a lot of the way to defining what you make so your content management system or your word processor or your video editor or your programming language, they might restrict, they might define, they might even inspire what you create. And sometimes constraints can be good and can inspire creativity and freedom can sometimes be paralyzing. So don't start with a big blank canvas that says the future of storytelling. Find a project brief or a starting point or a problem that someone has for the for the thing that you want to do. Um, and the last one is work in cross-discipline teams with lots of skills. So for this area, filmmakers and journalists and writers understand how to tell stories. Technologists specialize in what is possible to build and actually build it. And designers understand how to create the best thing for the user. And the best, most interesting work that I've been involved with has been with these three kinds of people. Um, ideally, you'll have people that have bits of all of those skills, or at least understand how the others work and have empathy. That's kind of it. So the last thing. Um, so right now, I'm starting a new project to develop new forms of stories for news on the web, where I think there's surprisingly little innovation. That's my slightly sarcastic view of what exists at the moment. Um, and I'm collecting examples of things that tell new stories really well in digital and on the web. Um, and do get in touch with me if you've got any favorite examples, or even examples which you hate. But examples are good. Um, and we're hoping to kind of create some new things in that space. There's lots I haven't talked about that the web enables, what's fake and what's real, collaboration and communities. But hopefully I showed you some things that you found interesting. I don't think we're anywhere near the potential of what we can do with our stories using the material of the web. And please keep using and inventing the web because it's one of our great inventions. Thank you. Tech Fury. <laughs>